Shabbat Shalom. As we've been going through the last couple of weeks through our identity, we've established that what's known as the church, the better known as the church, the assembly, the bride, Israel, they're all one when you follow Yeshua HaMashiach, who follows Yahweh. And that there is one fold, one sheep, one chosen, one crowd. And so we want to, now that we've established the who, now we establish how we to live. We've established the royal priesthood last week, and we want to take a look at how we are to live. And one of the most deep things that I hear particularly a lot of Christians talking about, and even on some grounds in, in the Messianic side as well, that there's no more no more law. Particularly in this instance, we want to look at the clean foods. We need to understand the royal priesthood must be without blemish, must be without blame, as we had seen last week in in Peter, where he talks about that and being a royal priesthood. So we want to look at clean foods. Nobody challenges the fact that Yahweh said it in Leviticus one, uh, chapter eleven, verses one through forty-seven. Nobody challenges that. And in Deuteronomy 14, verses 1 through 29, nobody questions the fact that, oh, he said, don't eat the pig. Yeah, he said that, but hey, over here, it's something different. So to expedite time, I just wanted to point out those verses, and we'll cover a, just a couple of them right now from Leviticus, from the Torah, because... You need to establish, when Yahweh says something, is he going to flounder, change his mind? Is he going forward and backward? And this is the idea that, that Christians oftentimes portray, is that you got a white, white-headed white fellow in the sky with a big, long, white beard down to his knees looking like ZZ Top or something, like some, some guy from a, motor, a motorcycle club who, who's a kind of a senile. He comes, he goes, he changes, he's got an emergency contingency plan and this and that. And that sounds like a senile guy in the sky. And we need to establish who's got the right teaching and who doesn't. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. Because if you cannot rightly divide the word of truth, people, that rather they come here and, and sojourn with us or not, they're going to get a little something here and they're going to get a little something there. And as we've seen before, people come and people go and people seem to think that they can get a little here and a little there. And they come back and they, their head is spinning around like the Looney Tunes or something. And their eyes are going around and around. And they can't make which end is up and which end is down. And we need to show these folks how to rightly divide the word of truth. So in the next series, we're going to be looking at cleanliness through today. And um, I think probably into next week a little bit more. So we want to break some of these things down. But for now, let's take a look at Leviticus uh, chapter 11 verses 1 through 4. These are the main ones. In, well, we can go down to verse 7. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth, whatever part of the hoof and is cloven-footed, and which choose to cut among the beasts that shall you eat. Nevertheless, there shall you not eat of them that choose a cod, and them that divides the hoof as the camel, because he that choose a cod and divides the hoof is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he choose a cod and divides not the hoof, is unclean to you. And the hare, because he choose a cod and divides not the hoof, he is unclean to you. 7. And the swine, Though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he choose a cud, he is unclean to you. Now, I've got to point this out, is that people, when they, they hear their doctor say, don't eat the pork, okay, Yahweh says it, they're thumbing their nose at it. And you really got to wonder, well, there's, there's people that 
wanted to barbecue and stuff with us and he said oh we'll bring some we'll have some some hot dogs and i said oh hey hey, hey we'll bring the hot dogs okay because we're gonna be having no no pork we don't eat no pork dog and so one one couple said are you communist against pork <laughs> i said well i guess i am because that is not clean for me that's not good for us and the seventh day adventist I remember in 2002 when we were in Florida and I was studying in this ministry that were, uh, my family and uh, some friends were involved with, then I saw this uh, wonderful teaching on them and they showed everything that Yahweh says in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, science has proven is not healthy for you. Well, let's put on our thinking caps for a moment. Wait a minute. Uh, would not Yahweh foresee that these things are not good for you? The pig rolls around, eats its own, oh, I can't even imagine. It just is in there rolling in its own feces and just having a grand old time. And this is what you want to eat? You got to wonder why churches love to have pork roasts. You see it all kinds of billboards, all kinds of signs, all the time. And people are just saying, hey, come to our pork roast. Oh, no, no, not us, not anyway. Yahweh says it, that's good enough for me. Now we need to look at some things where people say, well, it is, uh, in the new covenant, it is something different. Well, let's check that out and expose and exploit what those people teach. And let's get down to where, like, uh, like our teacher used to say, where the rubber meets the road, shall we? <laughs> I like that old expression. Let's get down to where the rubber meets the road. Let's check out one of the most familiar false teachings on this. Is Let's go to Acts chapter 11. Isn't that amazing? You go from Leviticus 11 to Acts 11. 11, 11. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Not hard to, to see how that's been perfectly aligned. Same chapter. Talk about the same things. And so uh, whenever you're ready, just... Give me a sign. Acts chapter 11. Let's, we'll go through this, but we'll, we'll touch on the high points on this. If, uh, if everyone is ready. And, um, okay, hallelujah. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard the Gentiles had also received the word of Elohim. And Peter, Kepha, was come up to Jerusalem. They that were with a circumcision contended with him, saying, went into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. Kepha rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw a certain vessel descend, and it had a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners. And it came even to me, upon which, when I had fastened my eyes, I considered, and I saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Kiva, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Master, for nothing common or unclean at any time has entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, Shemaim, when Elohim had, what well, Elohim is cleansed, that call not thou come. Okay, right there is where people just stop, they cut it, and they say, oh, this is where it's all, it's all good, we can eat whatever we want. Well, this is where problems arise. We need to finish the rest of the chapter to get the idea that Yahweh hasn't changed his mind. So verse 10. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up into heaven. So let's say this. So he says, let's rehearse this like he did three times. He says, take, kill, and eat. He says, not so, master. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. He says, take, kill, and eat. He says, not so. Never. Eat. And it ended with him saying, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. So that's the way that it ended. And 11. And behold, immediately there was three men already come unto the house where I was sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me 
go with them. Nothing doubting, moreover, these six brethren accompanied me and were entered into the man's house and showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, Kepha, who shall tell the words whereby thou in all thy house shall be saved. And he began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, as on us at the beginning, who see the Ruach coming upon them. Then remembered I the word of the Master, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized, or immersed, means to look fully wet, with the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit. For as much as Elohim gave them the gift, the light gift, as he did unto us, who believed on the Master Yeshua HaMashiach, what was I that I could withstand Elohim? When they heard these things, they were, they were peace, and praised Elohim, saying, then has Elohim also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life? Now that which were scattered abroad upon the persecution about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So he was amongst the dispersion, the ten tribes that were around there, and doing the thing to the Jews that were dispersed as well. But he was focusing only onto the tribe of Yehuda, the Jews. Now let's see what happens. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Crete. But when they were come to Antioch, spoke unto the Cretans, preaching the Master Yeshua, and the hand of Yahweh was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the master. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the assembly, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. And remember, Antioch, that was where a lot of things were happening. And we see later that uh, Shaul is keeping the, the Shabbat. Later on, uh, throughout Acts, we see him keeping the Shabbat even amongst Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? Gentiles keeping the Shabbat. So this is, also just wanted to point that out briefly, who when he came had seen the grace of Elohim, was glad and exhorted all with the purpose of the heart they could cleave unto the Master. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Master. Then departed Barnabas, to Tarshish, for to see Shaul. Now let's remember, it is, I believe it's Lucas, that is writing the book of Acts. And at this point of time, it's a, I believe, if I remember correctly, I've thought, man, 10, 20 years after, I believe, that Yeshua had ascended. So let's see what's happening here. Then departed Barnabas, Tarsus, to seek Shaul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass when the whole year they had assembled themselves to the assembly. How much people there were first called the Messianic, first in Antioch. Now we need to hop back to chapter 10 because I missed my, my focal point here that I wanted to make. I was reading that, that part in there. My apologies for uh, digressing. Now let's go and look. Here, let's start verse 8. So what we just went over was a retelling, and this is the first hand experience. And when he declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went to journey and drew nigh unto the city, Kepha went up on the housetop to pray at about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten but while they were made ready, he fell into a trance, and saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, 
and let down to heaven, wherein all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Like we went over before, he says, Kiefer said, No, master, for I have not eaten anything common or unclean. The voice spoke again, second time. And what Elohim has cleansed, thou not call thou common. This was done three times, and it ended just like that. Now while Peter, Kepha, doubted in himself, what the vision, vision, we need to focus on that, vision, we need to understand that it is a vision, that is like, it's a supernatural sighting, is basically what that means. And so this is not something that he is just making up on his own accord, but something that Yahweh is showing him. And for a reason, there's always a parallel, and there's always things to be said, things to be shown. And then you would say, why would Kepha say no to Yeshua? Certainly, because Yeshua did not eat the pig. Clearly, Kepha didn't either. Even 10, 20 years after the fact of Yeshua's ascension. I mean, we got to consider some things here that... For Yahshua to change his mind, we have to understand what's happening here. So, this is what people want you to believe, is that Yahweh changed his mind. Yahshua come, said, hey, we're going to help you out, and you're hungry, we hear you, you, you kill and eat anything. So, Kepha doubted in himself. He said, what does this vision mean? He knew it had a meaning. He knew the meaning wasn't, oh, I got the memo now. I could have ate or." anything I wanted for the last 10, 20 years. It's not like that. So let's continue onward a little bit and proceed. So we'll continue through this chapter a little bit too because we really want to get that essence of what is happening here. Critical. Critical to get this because most people stop right here and they say, there it is. This is the other the other chapter in, in 11. And this is what the, one of the two first chapters that they use to say, hey, everything's clean now, but we need to see what that vision meant. So let us continue onward. And called and asked whether Simon, whose surname, Kepha, who lodged there, while Kepha looked a thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And Kepha went down to the men which were sent unto him from who? Cornelius. And said, Behold, I am whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that fears Elohim, and of good report. Good report, that's always important. To have a good testimony, to have a good Good record, have good uh, good witnesses among all the nation, or among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from Elohim by an holy angel to send for three into his house and to hear the words of thee. Then called he them in the lodge, and them on the morrow. Kepha went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Kepha was coming into Cornelius and met him, and fell down at his feet and worshipped him, but Kepha took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he that said unto them, You know how that is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But Elohim has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Did you catch that, folks? Brethren, did you catch that? Let's go over this verse again. Acts 10, 28. 
And he said unto them, You know how it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But Elohim has showed me that I should call any food common or unclean. I shouldn't. No, that's not what that says. It says, But Elohim has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now, this doesn't mean that you you go uh, living with dogs and, and cats and having filth all over you. It's a different cleanliness, entirely different. And we need to rightly divide this and get a good understanding. Because some would say, well, uh, our daughter went and, and visited a, a friend uh, not too long ago. And she came out and covered in animal hair. They got pets running around. It's like an indoor zoo. Their house must be like a zoo with cats and dogs all over it. I mean, she was a walk-in fur factory. She was that covered in hair. So you get home, take them clothes off, shake them off, throw them in the wash, because that's where they're going. But that kind of uncleanly, uncleanliness creates bacteria. It creates germs, fleas, all kinds of things. You call that clean? You'll call that good. Yeshua came to save that which was lost. He didn't come to save that which was going to uh, fill your belly. He didn't come to, to make pigs clean. He didn't die so we can eat anything we want. And this is an abomination that these people would dare ever teach that Yahweh Elohim would change and, and would withdraw his word and, and that his son would die and his uh, blood, that righteous blood, was to cleanse pigs? Are you serious? This is what is such a, a head spinner for me, is that people think that that atoning blood atones food? The creeping things that creepeth upon the earth and the fowls of the air? Come on. He says, I came to save that which was lost. He says he his son was to die for our sins. He didn't say he ever died to... to rectify eating whatever we wanted wow where is that come from and where's it going i tell you it's right out of the deepest pit of hell that people would teach this it is an abomination it is a lie i tell you why it's an abomination because anytime people roll up the red carpet and they say hey this is like this don't worry about this we just spiritualize it and we can talk our way right out of anything. And hey, while they're doing that, they're talking themselves right into the pit. Right over into the abyss. And that's where they're going. Because any time where you put your word above Yahweh Elohim's word, woe unto you. Woe unto anybody that would ever dare say, hey, we're just going to spiritualize it. And we're going to make it whatever we want. Because when people do that, they're talking themselves right out of the law and right into the pit. Yeshua kept the law. He followed the law. Kepha, as we see here, as we just discussed earlier, is about 10, 20 years after the fact of Yeshua's ascension. I mean, did he not get the memo that, hey, we can eat all, anything we want? Of course not. He would have gotten that at the time of the, uh, he was on, Yeshua was on the stake. That wouldn't have been the thing. He would have, he knew Yahweh's law was sound. This is why up at the beginning of the chapter, he's saying he doubted within himself. He said, what does this vision mean? He would have gotten it if he knew, oh, yeah, that's right. The Torah says Yahweh would change and he would do something different and make all kinds of food edible. People, I was taught something the other day. Would well, you like seafood? I said, no, I hate seafood. I wouldn't eat that slimy stuff for any reason. I, I'd eat that grass out there like, uh, was it King Solomon? So, I'd be out there in the, in the field just devouring that grass, eating it like a cow. I tell you, I would, because they found more mercury in that stuff. There's more stuff that's in that that is not safe. And the more aquatic species that people want to try to digest in themselves, and the only reason that they do it is to say that, oh, hey, look, we're eating something that is so grand. I, I just spent two hundred bucks on two, two crabs, or, or whatever they just fished out of the depths of the ocean, and people want that, and they want to see it, and they want to say, hey, 
is all for prestige. We've got to get out of that stinking thinking, out of that mindset, because that thinking, worrying about what others are thinking, worrying about what, uh, and worrying about what anybody else is thinking and following and doing, takes you right off into the pit. And for those of you who are just joining us, we're in Acts chapter 10. We're right now on verse 28. Expounding has Kepha realized the vision says, but Elohim has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And it is from there that we're discussing how we're to live as being royal priesthoods and being how we're to live and conduct ourselves in in a way that is righteous, in a way that Yeshua would, in a way that Kepha would, Shaul would, where to walk even as he walked. Um, so if some of these things may sound strange to some of you, stick with us. And we intend to do as First Thessalonians 5.21 says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And we intend to do that. So we see here that Kepha is realizing his vision was not about Yahshua's death being to, as he says, Yeshua came to die for the sins of the world. He came to save that which was lost. He never said he came so you can eat some, some, some ham sandwiches. He never said this. He never said he came to make all foods clean. Yes, clean all people in the sense that we are, we can all become Israel. We can all become one sheep under one shepherd the assembly the sheep the house the royal priesthood are all one of the same when you're walking after yeshua earnestly this isn't something you do half-heartedly or half hazardly or anything like that it is a matter of diligence seeking that word living by that word and a, a wonderful motto that, that i hold fast to is Matthew, Matthew Tiyayu, chapter 4, verse 4, a man may not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. And so when you've got this into account, that we're to live by every word, well, this brings us back to our teaching. Does Yahweh change? Well, Malachi 3, 6 says, For I, Yahweh, change not. I mean, that's problematic. Yahweh doesn't change. And he equates his name with who he is with his word. Does Yeshua change? Well, let's see. Hebrew 13, 8 says, Yeshua HaMashiach, the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, how could anybody think that Yahweh, Yeshua, and the Ruach HaKadosh, which are all one, how could anybody ever think that they would change? Their word is who they are. They're locked in to who they are. Many times I hear say, Oh, the Almighty can do whatever He wants. No, He can't. He is locked in by His word. He cannot change. If He did, we would be in serious trouble. He would be saying, Hey, I'm going to be patient with you. Never mind, I'm going to strike you down now. All the grace that He showed Moshe, He could have struck him down real quick if He changed His mind and said, Forget about the plan that I have. Forget about my master plan, grafting in the ten tribes of Israel, grafting in other uh, nations that are strangers among the covenant. They're grafted into the covenant, not out. And we will touch on this down the road once we get through this series in Romans chapter 11 at a later time. I promise you we will come back to this and we will look at that. And as I touched on, John chapter 10 says that there's one shepherd one sheep. So many times we hear Christians, Messianics say, well, we're, we're in this group and we're in this group and Israel's different and the Jews are different and the church is different and nobody knows where they're coming or going. They don't know which end is up and which end is down. Instead, they spiritualize everything, want to stick their heads in a hole like an ostrich and hope to pull it out and see Yahshua one day. Well, ignorance is not bliss. You can't live by ignorance alone. And, uh, you know, to, to prove that, let's take a look real quick at two verses from John chapter 4, 
verses 23 and 24, Yohanan, chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, says, But the hour comes, and now is when the ignorance will worship it. Well, ignorant. Hey, wait a minute. That's not what it says. It says, Now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in ignorance? No. In spirit and in truth. We can't have it like Burger King. Like our old teacher said, You can't have it your way. It's His way. Or if you put your word above His, you made Yahweh a liar. And woe unto you for the father seeks such to worship him who does the father abba yahweh elohim seek those who seek him in spirit and in truth now this doesn't mean you're going to have an out-of-body experience start roaming the earth looking for him trying to figure out truth the spirit essentially you could say is the mind the mind is the arena of faith that's where you're going to take every thought captive. That's where you're going to decide to follow and obey and to pray and to seek him and communicate with him diligently like that. Just touching on that on a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you for putting those verses up there, sister. It is a wonderful thing that we need to understand. Worship in spirit and in truth. 24 says Elohim is a spirit. And they that worship him may, might, no, it says must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Must. This isn't, well, today I feel like uh, not, and well, tomorrow I don't, and I kind of go like this. This is a must. You're either in the car, on your way to him, or you're out. There's no in between. People want to sh try to color a shade of gray. People want to try to spiritualize everything and, and sense what they're doing is demonizing it. And the law is good. It is good. The only fault of the law was it didn't have the atoning blood that could wash away the sin. It could cover it temporarily, but you had to keep covering it and covering it. Yeshua's blood washes it away, washes our sins away. It doesn't wash away what we want to eat. It doesn't wash away how we want to live. It doesn't wash away those kinds of things. And so we need to be aware that has a royal priesthood. We need to conduct ourselves like so. So now let's take a look at the law. Just touch on this uh, briefly in this. And that is... I believe an important thing to touch on at this point, because when you get into clean foods or the Shabbat or any of the, the commandments, any of them, people all say, oh, there is no law. In the Again, Yeshua died to wash away our sin, to bring us into the covenant. He didn't die to make the pig clean. If you think so, you better get in the book and read the scriptures, because for those who would think this, uh, woe unto you, because this is not Yahweh's way, not his way at all. 1 John 3, 4. It's 1 John 3, 4. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Sin is a transgression of the Torah, which means instruction. Now, people say, you can't keep the law. There's just no way. 613 laws and precepts. That's it. And it relates to the, the human body and the skeleton and all of that. It's all there. There's a wonderful analogy. I've got a, a, a short teaching on that for those of you who seek deeper understanding of that. They say you can't keep it. I say, they're liars. They're ignorant. They don't know. We keep more laws in this country, in the United States of America, than in any other place. We have more laws just in the one state than Yahweh has. Isn't that amazing? We can keep that. We ain't got no problem not killing somebody. Murdering, I mean. We haven't got no problem doing all these manly things. 
Do we? I mean, Congress passes it. Oh, hey, we'll obey. Yes, yes, Master, let's bow down. We'll do what you say. Even when it comes to abortion and gay marriage and things like that, those things are surely sin and an abomination. And without law, there is, without law, there's no sin. Without sin, there's no need of a Savior. So what good is Yeshua to come to die to wash away our sins when there are no more sins left to be sinning? And when you look in the world, you look in the news, you've got to say, hey, this is getting crazier day by day. Abomination upon abomination, it's getting worse and worse and worse day by day. And if anybody doesn't believe it, just check out any news source, any news source. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's plenty of people that just want to commit murder and try to get away with it. And everybody's trying to outdo the, the other person's abomination. Well, my abomination is greater than yours. Wow, what an evil time we live in. But, hey, you're, you're going to go and burn in hell if... Uh, you break the speed limit, but forget the Shabbat. Let's forget about all that. Well, this is very interesting because it is better to follow Yahweh's law than man's law. It is certainly clear that that is what we should be doing and to follow him and to put man's law above his. That's what the Jews did of Yeshua's time and think what had happened with them with the whole situation. In that 70 AD, the temple fell. It was yet to be risen again because they put their laws above Yahweh's laws. And you ain't going to get blessed, truly blessed. I mean, I'm sure you'll get some, the devil passing off some, um, some false face blessings, making you think, oh yeah, keeping you blinded, keeping you going into them Christian pagan churches. They get up there to the, the pulpit. It'll pull you in the pit. And that ain't no lie. There's no lie at all. That pulpit will pull you in the pit. It's unrighteous teaching. They tell you, they say that Yeshua says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Yahweh said the same thing. They say, hey, we, we love the most high. They say, we, we can even call on his name. But do they love him? How do you know somebody loves them? By the fruits that they bear. Are they bearing righteous fruits? If they're not bearing righteous fruits, you know they don't love Yahweh. They love man. So many times I've heard one guy say, Oh, the round table theory, nobody can agree. You think everybody's going to agree? I don't need to go ask people what they think. I go right to Yah. Say, Yah, well, what's your word mean here? What's all this mean? What, what, what is this? What's happening here? Explain this to me. Enlighten me. Show me what this all means in Matthew 5 17 and 18 he says think not that I am come to destroy the law the Torah the instruction or the prophets I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill right there oh it's fulfilled it's all done <laughs> the fu fulfill means to complete it's like you get go through the alphabet you get to Z you don't throw all all 20 something letters away that was comes before it and disregard them do you Yeshua did not come to do away with the law but to place the law in our hearts he does this by placing his ruach in us the commandments are no longer written on tablets but on the flesh of the heart the mind it's where the seal is and being a royal priesthood the assembly the sheep we need to be aware of this. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the Torah till all be fulfilled. I had one one crazy mad madman minister one time say, Oh, all was fulfilled on the cross. I had to say, Are you kidding? All was fulfilled on the cross? Every messianic prophecy? Yeah, yeah. I said, It is? Heaven and earth has passed away. We're living in the kingdom. We're in a thousand year reign. Yeshua has returned. What? Are you serious? And this is what irks me. 
And this is where people say, well, can't you just get along? Oh, what they're saying is, oh, brother, can't you just compromise? First of all, I ain't your brother. If you ain't following Yeshua HaMashiach, and you ain't living by his word, in the word of Abba Yahweh, I don't want it. It is no good. It is heathen worship. Heaven and earth has not passed away because Yeshua has not returned. Yeshua came to complete the law about what was written about his coming. Those messianic prophecies are fulfilled, but not the one about his return. These things are written about him in the old covenant. So we need to pay attention. Revelation 21, 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Revelation 21, verse 1, makes it clear. The earth has changed here. It's changed. And so all that we know, the law would be extremely clear to us at that point, and it will still be valid. There's no doubt about that. It just amazes me how people want to say the law is passed, but, hey, forget the Levitical priesthood, except where it concerns money. Oh, well, that changed over to the church. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> it, it, it changed over from uh, before 70 AD. <laughs> right. And if you believe that, I got a bridge uh, down in Brooklyn to sell you. It, it's just unbelievable. And how... Are we to understand these things? How to rightly divide the word of truth is to stay with one good solid teaching. Uh, don't hop here, hop there. Be like we read last week in in the, the Torah readings. Grasshoppers. They hop around and hop around. Oftentimes up here we call uh, courts kangaroo courts because they would hop around and hop around. They couldn't give you a definitive answer. They can't give you anything that is righteously righteous justice so instead what you get instead of righteous justice you get some crooked justice but in the torah reading he is talking about you always talking about grasshoppers <laughs> basically the same thing they like to hop around and hop around and that's not the way royal priesthood should be that's not the way the assembly is to function that's not the way that yahweh ever intended things to be so we looked at now let's look at another verse is pr problematic for Christians that think, oh, it, it's it's all good, it's all cleaned up. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We'll look at one verse here. Verse 19. Mark 7, 19. Mark 7, 19. Because it enters not into his mouth, but into his belly, and goes out into the drop, purging all meats. This is because it does not enter into his heart, but into the waste bowl, purging all food, because it does not enter into him, into the heart, but into the belly, into the waste bowl, goes out, purging all food. Yeshua does not declare all meats clean. In the, the, the most diabolical translation of this can be found in NIV, where they, they add, in Jesus declares all foods clean. <laughs> no way. This is added when you look in the J.P. Green Interlinear Bible, you realize that's not what it's saying. It's basically saying what we're spewing makes us unclean. The things that we say, the things that we do. Purging all food is more of a question. Purges it when it comes out? That's kind of a uh, sick interpretation of what goes in must come out, but it doesn't come in clean and it don't go out clean. It's rather talking about the heart and the intent and then the mind. The, like we keep saying, the mind is the arena of faith. That's where you're going to either decide to follow and be obedient, or you're going to go walking sideways in, in every kind of damnable, heretical teaching that there is out there. We've I've heard everything from Muhammad is going to be one of the, the witnesses uh, at the end times. <laughs> Mom, where do people get this stuff from? But they go a little here, a little there. They hop on the internet and they read the first thing that they read. And they rather they don't read the Torah. They don't read the the writings and the prophets in the Brit Hadashah and ask Yahweh 
read it for yourself and ask him. You know what I like to do when I want to go over a large amount of scripture in, in a long period of time? I have Bible tapes. I have it on audio. and uh, Or I just copy a large part out and I put it into my readme on my computer and it reads it. And therefore, after a, a, an hour, my eyeballs aren't going around and round in circles like the Looney Tunes. Instead, I can hear it and I can keep my mind refreshed. I can say, oh yeah, that's what that meant. I remember being taught this. I remember hearing that. And oh, I got to write that down and, and save this and use this for a teaching later on. If I went and I heard every kind of person that was out there preaching something that is other than what the scripture says, I would be uh, fruitier than that fruit loop bird. I would be. But you got to hold fast to that which is good. Like First Thessalonians 5.21 says, you got to hold fast. you got to keep steady on it. you got to be diligent. You gotta seek that. Seek ye out of the book, he says. So it's it's just amazing how people have misrepresented even messianics. Some of them don't believe. They believe like the Christians, hey. And what they want to do is give you a conveyor belt of cheap, easy um, salvation. Let's run them out and and we'll say, hey, look at us. We're we're building up good. We're building up a lot of people here. We, yeah, we, sure. Building up false teaching. And where the masses are, it's where I get concerned. I start hearing people talk about cathedrals and things like that. I get concerned because I know broad is a road that leads to destruction. And there's many be there that find it. For narrow is the gate and narrow is the way or hard pressed is the way that leads to life. So with that understanding that We've only touched on the law has not changed. It's still applicable. Yeshua is talking about fulfilling the commandments, or fulfilling the law and the prophets, the Torah and the prophets, means that he fulfilled the writings. And when you were working on putting up another a web page showing the prophecies that Yeshua had filled, it is unbelievable. He'd be born of a virgin. He would be born at a, in Bethlehem. When you take all these things, his beard would be ripped, all kinds of things like this. It leaves you with a 0% probability that it was that he was not the Messiah, that, that he had to be the Mashiach, that he is the anointed one. Because when you have those kind of staggering odds, to fulfill one or two, you could say this could be this one, this could be that one. But to fulfill every one of them, it leaves with zero probability of hoax. It really does. It is just overwhelming that to have a prophecy be fulfilled time and time and time again. And that's what that verse means in Matthew, uh, Matthew 5.17. It is about abolishment of a do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. If if he did abolish it, he'd be abolishing himself and the Father because they are the Word. That Word is who they are. And like I said before, Yahweh don't change. That means Yahweh is limited by his Word. He's locked in. He's a contract. This is a guy, this is a, a, a mighty one that loves a covenant. You're going to get to know him. You're going to accept his covenant. And that means his word. It's a contract. You're going to come into this saying, well, I'm going to change this, y'all. I don't like this. I'm going to do like this. I'm going to change it around. You're going to be finding yourself over in the pit, right over in the abyss. You'll be going right into the lake of fire. And there's just no way. There's no other way around it. You ain't going to come all up in your space telling him how to do things. He can't lie. He can't, he can't cheat. He can't steal. He can't break his own word. And when I say he's limited by this, do not think that I'm underestimating him. I'm only showing you that he is somebody that you can build a foundation on. Because if he, if he changed his mind, he went forward and backward and up, down, left and right. You can't build on that. 
you couldn't build on Yeshua. You couldn't build on that. It would be awful. And that is what we need to understand as a royal priesthood, as the bride, as the assembly, as the sheep. We need to keep those thoughts in mind that we serve a wonderful, powerful, mighty one that above all things, he can make all things possible through Yeshua HaMashiach who strengthens us. Now First Timothy 4 verses 2 and 3. First Timothy verses 4, chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanded to abstain from meats, which Elohim has created to be received with thanksgiving from them which believe and know the truth. I believe the answer here is this, which Elohim has created to be received. What did he create to be received? He told us back in Leviticus chapter 11 verses 1 through 47 in Deuteronomy chapter 14 verses 1 through 29. He told us what is to be received. And this is why you're going to go over to somebody else's place. You want to be very mindful. I'll tell them, uh, hey, right off the bat, I, no pork. No onions, no tomatoes. I hate all that stuff. <laughs> I just assume <laughs> throw them in the trash. <laughs> but uh, all kidding aside, the pork is a serious thing. Because like I said before, when the doctors say don't eat it, okay. Yahweh says, don't eat it. No, oh, wow, he didn't mean that. Oh, he, he means like this. and You're tearing up Yah's word. And woe unto those that do. Now if he had created clean foods. And then changed his mind in the new covenant. That would be a serious problem. Because Yahweh doesn't change. So we got to ask ourselves now. Either the Almighty is a liar and wrong. Senile or something. Or he does not change. And it is Christian dumb. That has been so bent on escaping the Hebraic heritage and to make it more sellable to the mainstream public, saying, oh, we're all free to do whatever. Just give us that money. Give us that 10% Levitical tie. We need that. It, it amazes me when it comes to good, wholesome teaching from the Torah, Christians don't want it. Even some Messianics don't want it. When it comes to money, Oh, yeah, we got our palms all greased up for you. We want that 10%. Really? How diabolical is that? That you would think that Yahweh needs money. He would need clearly, Yeshua clearly said, freely you have received. Freely charge him? <laughs> That's not what he said. Freely you have received. Freely give. This is highly highly problematic for people that are in this line of thinking now we'll look at the next two verses from first timothy 4 4 and 5 for every creature of elohim is good and nothing be refused if it be received with thanksgiving yeah for it is sanctified by the word of elohim and prayer this is where they seem to think it's all cleansed and this is where you need to be very mindful when you go over to somebody's place you don't know you're getting to be friends with or something or, or getting to know. You don't want to be sitting down there and, and have to refuse them because they put a big pork chop in front of your, your face. You know, it, it, it'd be a, a bad thing for you, for them. A bad testimony all the way around. It says every creature is of Elohim is good. There's no doubt every creature is good. He says that back in the, the Bereshit, the Genesis. And he created life and he created this and that he says and he saw that it was good there's no doubt it's good but he's not saying it's good to eat and nothing be refused this is where they say nothing be refused but we got to understand the context the people that wrote this and being written to understood the torah they knew what they would be expecting so it would come down to more or less of refusing something because you don't like it it's not a matter of the way we perceive it now, every a lot of people back then in those times wouldn't eat the pig. They know it was a disgusting creature. Many of them don't now. 
ones out of Ishmael don't. And, and those people, they know that uh, Arabs and stuff, they don't eat the, the pork. And somebody asked me before, are you Muslim? I'm Muslim because they don't want to eat pork? Are you serious? Do I, do I look like a Muslim to you? <laughs> it, it, it just amazes me the way that people think. So what was the thing with not to be refused? Like I said, a lot of those people weren't pork eaters at the time. They Some were, some weren't. Um, or, or most weren't at the time, particularly for the Jews, who it was being written to and from and things like that to be received with thanksgiving. So you don't want to get yourself in a bind in, in this, for it is sanctified by the word of Elohim in prayer. Sanctified by the word. What is sanctified by the word? What is set aside by the word? We, we just touched on it in uh, Leviticus chapter 11. In, uh, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 14. Yeah, so we know what is sanctified. We know what is set aside. But they're seeing it as, oh, we just pray over this uh, unclean beast or, or some mercury and voila, it's all good in the hood. Not the case. It's not the case at all. And it is clearly not what Yahweh intended for Christians to tear apart his word. Every creature is good. Like I said, it's what Yahweh says. Every creature is good. Everything is good. Everything Yahweh creates is good. However, this does not mean that every creature is good for food. For even science can prove that. Sanctified means set aside. Set aside by the word. Not our word. His word. The Torah. The teaching. The instruction. Which almost all Christians hate or despise in some way or another. Who can sanctify anything? Who can set aside anything? There is only one who can truly sanctify anything, and that is Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh sanctified and set apart what was clean and what was healthy for us long ago. Some minor research, and you can find that what Yahweh calls unclean is the most unhealthy food there is. Like I said before, did Yahweh not anticipate this? Of course he did. He knew. They say they make pork without salt now. Doesn't matter. It's still unhealthy. It's still unclean because the beast is unclean. It rolls around in its own slop. That is horrible. It's disgusting. You want to eat a buzzard? A vulture? Things that are, are nothing more than a, a, a walking trash cleaning compactor that just go over the earth and scour and devour all kinds of little trash and garbage and dead things and eating maggots. Yuck! No, that is awful. That is disgusting. You can only pray over it. You can pray over it all day long, and it will still be unclean. It will still be unhealthy. It will still not be set aside by what Yahweh said. When Yahweh sanctifies something, it is sanctified. It is set aside. And there's the real clincher to this. 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, you've got to read verse 5 and have the right spirit to understand what is sanctified. What is sanctified? You think I can sanctify, make holy, set aside anything? Well, <laughs> if only I could. <laughs> I don't. But you think I got the power to put food coloring in water and separate it? <laughs> no. I haven't got any kind of authority or power like that. Well, we can pray over it, and mercury still mercury. And that's that. Hit your kosher pig on Route 60. <laughs> yeah, they've got it. They got it. They, they say that it's kosher, but I don't believe it. I mean, it's still disgusting swine. And, and look at that swine flu that, that popped around just a matter of a couple of years ago. Oh, man, yummy, you know, makes you really want to get into that some more. Most Christians hate the Old Covenant because they don't want to accept the Torah. They don't want to accept law. Instead of embracing it, they reject it. Either way, no matter what, we will all be judged according to our works. We're either judged now or we're judged then. Personally, I'd rather have the stripes be on this side and, and take it on this side, some chastising and correction to make it into the kingdom in a righteous state, rather than to be judged then. Come up in the judgment resurrection there is not going to be a good thing 
So I'll take my lumps and bumps now. Thank you very much. I'd rather prepay and make sure I'm all paid up to snuff at that point of time. So we're, we're going to get ready to wrap things up here. As I've touched on earlier, uh, Matthew 18, 11, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Luke 15, 6, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice for me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man is coming to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come to save and make clean pigs, buzzards, maggots, or any other kind of hideous, unclean uh, creature. Clearly, he did not. And let us remember that we're grafted into Israel, not out. Like Colossians 3.11 says, there's neither Jew nor Greek. We're grafted in as one sheep, one fold. There's not two different sets of laws. One for the Jews, one for Israel, one for the Christian, one for the sheep, one for the bride. This would be madness. Total, absurd madness. 1 Corinthians 15.3 For I delivered to you at the first that which I also received, that Mashiach died for our sins according to the scriptures. Mashiach died not to save the piggy and all this. That is absurd. He didn't die so that the church can gather up the 10%. He didn't die to make buzzards clean and all kinds of other hideous things that were not sanctified. Yeshua died for our sins, not to make unclean animals clean, but rather to make people clean through his sacrifice, through the atoning blood. Yeshua died for our sins, not to set us free from the Torah, but to obey it and follow him just as he did. So we need to make sure that we're walking in accordance to him and to the word and law of Yahweh. So let us remember that Yeshua Mashiach died for our sins. He came to say that which was lost. So if anybody challenges you, they say, Oh, the pig, this little piggy's clean, and that little piggy's clean, and we can eat the pork chops and ham sandwiches now, and eat them buzzards and the roadkill, and every other kind of diseased, parasitic animal that is unclean. Point these verses out. Send them to this teaching, and send them this. So with that... I just hope and pray that this has been enlightening to, to those who have heard it. And may Yahweh add a understanding unto those that have heard this word. And may Yahweh guide you and strengthen you. And we just thank you and praise you all. Thank Yahweh and praise Him for each and every one of you that is here with us tonight on this early Shabbat. So at this point of time, close out in the... We just ask and pray that Yahweh's Ruach will be upon each of us, healing us, guiding us, and strengthening us in all the ways that we all need. So we just praise Yahweh for each and every one of you. And we ask Him to touch your hearts, lives, families, in all the ways that they need. And we ask this all in Yeshua's precious holy name. So it is said, so let it be done. Hallelujah.